Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. My name is Chloe Casagrande and I am presenting on behalf of Dr. Tony Wilson's lab in the Conda Center at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And before we begin, we have no financial relationships or conflicts of interest to disclose. So our lab is a cognitive neuroimaging lab that primarily utilizes magnetoencephalography and magnetic resonance imaging technologies. MEG is a technology that measures the magnetic field generated by the electrical activity of neurons, uh, most primarily the summation of postsynaptic potentials. Importantly, the magnetic permeability of tissues does not dramatically differ, so the magnetic signal that is picked up by the MEG is not distorted by the scalp, skull, or CSF in the way that electrical signals are in EEG. MEG has excellent spatial and temporal resolution that gives us the opportunity to study human oscillatory activity in neuronal networks. As the title indicated, our study was focused on examining the impact of HIV infection on human somatosensory processing and inhibitory functioning via a multimodal neuroimaging approach. HIV infection has been shown to have extensive effects on brain structure and function, but the degree to which structural abnormalities directly translate into brain, uh, functional brain aberrations is less well understood. So we aim to bridge this gap of knowledge specifically in the somatosensory domain. Sensory gating is a neurophysiological phenomenon in which the neural response to the second stimulus in an identical pair of stimuli is dramatically reduced relative to the first. This mechanism is thought to be a measure of inhibitory activity and reflect the brain's capacity to filter out less relevant sensory information to maintain cognitive resources for more behaviorally relevant or salient stimuli. For this study, we recruited 109 participants between the ages of 27 and 60 to undergo the paired pulse MEG paradigm, 3T structural MRI, and extensive demographics. At least 80 paired pulse trials were administered to each participant with an ISI of 500 milliseconds and an IPI which varied between 4,500 and 4,800 milliseconds. From the artifact corrected MEG preprocessed data, we derived spectral power estimations per sensor and averaged over trials to generate time frequency plots of mean spectral density. These were normalized using the respective bins baseline power from the negative 700 to negative 300 millisecond time window preceding stimulus onset. Cortical networks were imaged through the dynamic imaging of coherent sources or DICS beamformer. And this technology employs spatial filters in the time frequency domain to calculate source power for the entire brain volume. Voxel time series were then extracted from each participant's data. As for the structural MRI, preprocessed images were segmented based on an adaptive maximum a posteriori technique and normalized to MNI template space. The, neuro the neuromorphometrics atlas was then used to estimate the volume of the postcentral gyri. And the volumes of the postcentral gyri were ultimately extracted, averaged across laterally, and corrected for total intracranial volume. As for our results, we applied a full, our data to a full mediation model. And as seen to the left, persons with HIV had significantly reduced postcentral gyrus volumes relative to healthy controls. These smaller volumes subsequently predicted higher peak frequencies in response to the first somatosensory stimulation, although this was not seen after the second stimulation. We further used important HIV clinical metrics in the model to relate our structural and functional information. The model revealed that smaller postcentral gyrus volume was associated with lower current CD4 counts and a longer time since HIV diagnosis. Greater current CD4 counts were also, interestingly, associated with significantly lower peak, frequency, peak frequencies or peak frequencies that were more similar to controls during the second stimulation response. This next slide gives a visual representation of two important findings. We computed the mean power of the spontaneous neural activity during the baseline period, which revealed that persons with HIV had significantly increased absolute power during this period relative to controls, which strengthens evidence previously shown by my colleague Rachel Spooner. On the bottom right, I have shown a bar graph of the peak frequency responses to the first somatosensory stimulation, in which you can see a marked increase in the responses of 
persons with HIV relative to controls, which is fully mediated by postcentral gyrus volume. So to conclude, our study revealed that persons with HIV exhibited smaller postcentral gyrus volumes relative to their control counterparts and higher peak frequency responses to somatosensory stimulation. This was explained by a full mediation model. Further, higher CD4 counts recorded from less immunocompromised persons with HIV predicted lower peak frequency responses. Our study, of course, had a few limitations, including the cross-sectional design rather than longitudinal approach and our lack of examination of the potential effects of different antiretroviral therapies on somatosensory functioning. With this information and others supporting neurocognitive dysfunction in patients with HIV, we strongly recommend further research to examine sensory functioning, gating, and inhibitory processes in these patients. I have included my references. And before I go, I would like to thank my collaborators, participants, mentors, and PI for their support, as well as the hosts of the symposium for providing me the chance to share my work with you today. My contact information can be found below. Thank you.